welcome you to the March meeting of the Hampton Roads Bird Club. And I was looking for my talk from last year, as I always use it as a point to then start a new talk. And we didn't have a talk because of course last year at this time we were just starting to get introduced to our own disease since we're talking about conjunctivitis and bird pox, which has now dominated our lives for a number of days. Of course, that being the wonderful, wonderful COVID virus. I hope you've all gotten your vaccines or in line to get some vaccines and trying to get some vaccines. I was lucky enough to get my vaccine, but I told people I was a high school teacher. So um, at least trying to get it so I don't die because I do have comorbidities. But nevertheless, let's go through and do as we do and chit chat about the birds that we've been seeing or not seeing. So our agenda as always is to welcome new members and visitors. So do we have any new members or visitors with us this evening? Don't be shy, just say hello. Put something in the chat. Okay, so I'm gonna take that as no new visitors. So moving on, let's see if we can share any new bird sightings. There's a lot of things going on. The weather's been nice. What have we been seeing out there? So this is probably, folks are seeing them, but there's uh, ospreys are back in the area. It was interesting because I was recording the bird count at the, at the park and we did see an osprey and I got questioned on it by Cornell, but they accepted my, uh, my reply. I guess it's a little early, but yeah, not too, too much. Um, I had uh, some the consistent uh, winter birds in my backyard. Um, still got purple finches, uh, occasionally siskins, uh, red-breasted nuthatch. And then this past weekend, I had 11 fox sparrows. Wow. wow. Well, that's exciting. That's a lot of fox sparrows. Just out of curiosity, Dave, what's the most fox sparrows you've ever seen at once? Uh, I think that's probably it. I, I have two uh, bluebird boxes in my backyard. And on Tuesday, I went out there checking the boxes and one of them I have five eggs in. Wow. wow. Yeah, outside my window, there's a, a tree, an old walnut tree that's on its way out. And there's a lot of dead large trunk pieces. And there's a starling that's making a nest sadly up there. But it was giving a squirrel a run for its money. It chased the squirrel all the way down the tree. It chased it across the street. I've just never seen starlings so persistent in pursuing a squirrel. So it was kind of funny to, to watch. This is Angie. And um the ruddies are still on the water, and I, I too have seen ospreys um, in the last couple of days. Hey, Pete hasn't said anything yet, Charm here. So he said, look out the window. So we see this bird pulling up worms in the ground, and it's a broadwing hawk. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a little bit different. <laughs> I, I've just never seen hawks going after worms. Yeah. Especially since there's nicer things to eat. Well, he wasn't having any luck with the voles or the moles, unfortunately. That's really cool. It sounds like we're seeing a lot of cool behaviors. Anyone else see any cool behaviors? Well, I've had a, an interesting one uh, just a couple of days ago. I had two mallards in my backyard, and the male stood right in the middle of the backyard. And the female walked around my entire yard looking under each shrub, um, obviously looking for a place to build a nest. And the, and the male just kept, you know, alert in the, in the middle of the yard and never moved. And I guess she didn't find anything she liked because they eventually moved on. Hmm. Well, that's kind of cool, too. All right. Well, very good. So tonight I'm gonna to try something a little bit different for identification challenges. I'm gonna to try to do some audio. 
So that's what I was playing with. It was giving me a little bit of trouble, but I think we should be able to work this out. So uh, I have it, so Zoom should play audio. So if your volume's down, you might turn it up just a little bit. And let's see if we can get some audio identifications going um, this week. Common yellow throat. Okay, so we have common yellow throat. So I try to put in the sonogram so we could see that witchety, witchety, witchety. Mm -hmm. um, I put this picture from Sibley. If you haven't looked at the webpage, the New York Times ran a story not too long ago that had some images about urban birds and associated sonograms. And on theirs, the sonograms were kind of um, animated. So you can see them run through a couple seconds to a I think 30 seconds or so of the bird song. So it's just kind of cool to see um, the birds and, and really picturing the sound of those songs. And it wasn't warblers only, there was ducks and some other things, but it didn't have a chance. You could check out that Facebook link or just Google like songs of birds in New York City and you can find that. If you're really interested, I can also just send you the link if you email me. Okay, so let's pause. Let's try this one. Northern Perula. Perula. Oh. Okay, so we got Northern Perula, so we're doing really well. Let's pause. Next. I said pause. Next slide. Oh, oh uh, uh, no, 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 the little uh, white and yellow and uh, got all those weird so. Chat, chat. Yes, so yellow-breasted chat. So we are rocking and rolling. Good, good, good. And then one more. Ah! Ta <laughs> So as we saw, that was the palm warbler. Now, the some palm. of them might have a weird accent because mm. I stole some of those sounds from out west. There's a nice uh, site from Arizona. And so I stole those sounds because they were the easiest that I could get to work within i worked on those four things for like four hours the other day because I couldn't get PowerPoint to play the sounds and then I wasn't going to give up, but I eventually got them to work. So hopefully that is, is inspiring you a little bit to think about the coming months and go and think about bird songs. And I find that while we're getting warmer, that excites me and I start to study more about bird songs. So I have these four links and I know you can't link to them right now, but in coming days, I'm going to put them on the Facebook page, but I'm also going to send a message out to the group about learning bird songs, especially this introduction to e-birding. It's a very nice page that talks about how do you read the sonograms and taking some different approaches, being more of an audio birder than just uh, using your eyes. And as we know, 90% of birding quite frequently is listening to bird calls. So I collected a few items together that I think would be useful for learning and reminding ourselves about warblers in the coming months. So I'll send that out to everyone. And hopefully you found this to be a little bit of a fun change of pace for our identification challenge. So for the committees, let's go through and see if we have anything a new. Gwen, is there anything new to report on your front? Uh, nothing new to me. All right, I know uh, we don't really do much with hospitality currently, but I know Jane's doing those wonderful walks and I've seen a good amount of things in Newport News Park, which is wonderful. Tom, anything you wish to add about the newsletter? 
Well, I just uh, thank you to the authors of the newsletter, like uh, Bill Bay and uh, uh, yourself, I guess, forwarding the stuff on our our, our speaker tonight, and uh, uh, Pete and uh, 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 the coal stocks. And congratulations to the winners of the photo contest. That's about it. Uh, I don't see my uh, web page. Anything um, to report there? Nothing. Nothing new on the web page. I just okay. When I see something, I try to post it. And let yep. you know. Okay. Good. Yep. I'm just making sure I didn't miss anything. Um, in the field, I think this month, and Harry can correct me about going to some Virginia Beach birding sites. Do you want to add anything to that? I just copied it from the web page, but not too much. Yeah, the, the, that's basically it. Um, Little Island Park is on uh, both sides of the uh, road as we go down there and Sandbridge. And then we'll go down to Back Bay and then we'll come out and just a little bit further as we're going out, we'll go to the, uh, there's a retention pond at, near Harris Teeter and then two other large bodies of water in the neighborhoods there that uh, birds have been reported at. In fact, we, I went uh, last weekend and there's still quite a bit uh, at those, those two other sites. But um, we'll be seeing some changes at, at Back Bay with this warmer weather. We're likely to get some early uh, migrants. And there's still some uh, good birds out on the the fishing pier there at Little Island Park. Uh, we've got uh, lined up for April a uh, dismal swamp and we're looking towards a May. We don't have, historically I don't think we've had a May one. We've had a, a, a party or something like that but we'd like to do York River State Park on the 8th of May. It's still within the heavy um, migrant migration, so we might get some good stuff there, too. Good, that sounds very good and exciting. Let's see. All right, so, you know, if you want to mention again, I know you sent an email out about the spring bird count, but I didn't think it would be bad to remind people once more. If not, I can just leave this saying, hey, make sure you sign up with Bill. Yeah, that's fine, Sean. I'm going to read it to the folks uh, back at home there. Uh, but yep, a reminder to all, I did send an email out uh, yesterday. So uh, please reply to me if you'd like to participate. Hope uh, we get some good numbers. Great. Outstanding. Okay. And so something that's been happening, and part of it's a, a misunderstanding on my part, a few months back, I was contacted, but through my Hampton email, and long story short is I, the Hampton libraries wanted to have some programs, both as kind of speaker programs, but also outside programs. And so recently I recorded a little thing for them about how to get started birding, really basic, picking out binoculars, finding a field guide, just being interested in going outside. What do you look for for a bird? But they want to build on that, having a few different lectures, like how to attract birds to your yard and some things about like migration, but also have the Hampton Woods Bird Club involved in all those items. And if someone wants to help develop presentations and uh, we can do that. So it's just not me doing those things because I thought they were asking me as a Hampton person, but it was really for the bird club and then do some walks around Hampton, maybe doing a few guided walks around Fort Monroe or Grandview and um, Sandy Bottom. Now, again, COVID still being cautious. We talked about numbers of people and there will be registrations, but I wanted to throw it out to the club so I'm not unilaterally making decisions, but that everyone has some means of input. So what is the group's thought? One, continuing doing these little videos that might help people um, become more familiar with birding, advertising the Hampton Roads Bird Club. If um, I can share with you, but I put our logo on every one of the slides that we had talking about birding and coming to the bird club and things of that nature. 
So it is kind of advertising the bird club along with giving some people some education. But what about the walks? Is that something we would be interested in doing? Would there anyone who'd be interested in doing that? So again, just your general thoughts. Well, I mean, I, I mean, I would uh, help out with walks if uh, if uh, we decide as a club we want to do that. Uh, I mean, okay. Some nice places uh, to take people out, or easily accessible, and you know, good birds. Great, Dave. So, as Dave mentioned, if we're willing to do that, is that something as you current members here are interested in participating? Is kind of building a bigger footprint in Hampton proper with doing some outreach stuff in the sense of just going out and bird and showing people around. So let me phrase it this way. Is anyone opposed to doing anything like that? You know, you guys are as bad as my students. You subconsciously- I think it's a good idea. It's a oh, good yeah, idea. Thanks, I, I think it's, uh, uh, um, I'm glad, you know, really good birders like uh, Dave are stepping forward. All right, good. And I see John gave a thumbs up. So again, I think it's just about getting some people interested in doing things. And I know there's been hesitation in the past where people haven't felt as confident as birders. But my feeling is from talking to the people at the library is just some people want to know more about birds. And, you know, they're happy even if you can't tell what gall it is, but it's some gall. And telling someone why you don't know what gall it is because you can't see those future features or characters is still an educational kind of experience. So, um, yeah, and we're probably um, better than anybody that's going to sign up at one of those places. So, if you don't think you're a, an expert birder, you're a lot better than those people that are probably going to sign up. Yep. Yep. Thanks, Dave. So, we'll, I'll contact them more about that and trying to do some activities, of course, low impact and nothing too strenuous or crazy. Um, and again, if you're someone who's interested in helping to put together some of those lectures, so far they've been pre-recorded and they've been, tomorrow I think is the first time that they're posting it and I forgot about it and I did it relatively quickly. So don't anyone here go and sign up and then tell me how horrible it is. I already know it's horrible, but um, it's out there. Tom also reminded me last spring, we did some walks at Mariner's Museum where we were having a good time doing some interaction with the public there, but doing a different bird walk and seeing what forest birds and a few of the waterfowl that were hanging out. Now that was going to also take place in the fall, but COVID was around. And I know COVID things are changing a little bit. Kathy, I did see your hand. Just please let me uh, finish and I'll get to it. I apologize. But if they're doing things at the Mariner's Museum again, is that something we would like to start back up? But before I throw that question out. Kathy had her hand up kind of when I started. Kathy, what did you wish to comment or question? I was going to go back to the former topic. Yep. Um, when are they hoping to uh, this partnership? What's the, are they hoping to get this on the ground and running by uh, the fall or? Well, so steps? I already have three lectures prepared that I've recorded for them because I've recorded for the another reason. So they're going to start deploying these lectures about one, the one was how do you kind of become a birder? The next one I have prepared is like how to use a field guide and start looking at birds and start looking at birds critically. And then one that I have just a little bit about bird behavior. So when you're looking at a bird, it's just not an eider or it's just not a great blue heron, but you're thinking about males and females and mating and nesting and breeding. So just a quick 30 minute 40 minute introduction to those kind of themes. And so that's going to happen this spring. Um, and then we're hoping to try to get some walks going this spring too, because if summer comes, it's kind of hot and busy and not seeing so much. And then all the way in the fall, people kind of forget things have started. Well, well I guess my question is, what, what are they thinking? Once a month or uh, something that can be pulled up as, as needed or um, a, yeah, a so, by the fall, 
Yeah. No. So they didn't know because they hadn't had a way to gauge participant interest. I know the little talk tomorrow, because um, you have to sign up, has like 50 people who bought, I don't know if they would buy tickets, but I'm saying sign up for tickets. Um, so I didn't do it when they wanted to, but after I gave it to them, they already had 50 people sign up in a day or so. So it seems like there's some general interest. And I imagine if we were going out and about, there would be more of an interest. And I've been contacted by a few people in the area that have wanted to do some birding things, like some school teachers and just some other people because of the, the website and stuff. Like, hey, do you do bird walks in Hampton? It's really far to go to Newport News Park and things like that. So there seems to be some local or regional interest. But I don't know how frequently they want to do that. And I also am very respectful that most of us are very busy with master naturalists, master gardeners, life, retirement, hmm. fighting off COVID. Okay, thank you. I would yep. go for it, whatever we okay. can give them, I guess. Okay, and I'll follow up with seeing if they have a clearer idea about that. So related to the Mariners Museum, are uh, people interested in that? If they're still doing things, would you? So another way of saying is, will you come? Um, if that's something that we do, like the last Sunday of the month. Got my vote. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I I'd, I'd come. All right. So thank you for the feedback. That seems like we have those goals, and I'll follow up with them. And that's all I have for the evening. Are there any general announcements before we move on to our fantastic, outstanding speaker for tonight? Okay, well, hearing none, uh, I'm going to be quiet and uh, say thank you for listening. Thanks for playing the What Sounds at Warbler, and maybe we'll have some more sounds in the future. Okay, so uh, uh, I'm Pete Peterman, and I'm going to um, give the introduction to Dr. Johnston, who is the Associate Professor of Wildlife Ecology and Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Maine at Presque Isle. He has conducted research on breeding wood thrush, house sparrows, hermit thrushes, northern cardinals, boreal birds, and others on topics from long-term demographics, physiological ecology, nest desertion, habitat quality, food use, and impacts of wind turbine. He has a PhD from the University of Maine in Biological Sciences, his master's degree is in entomology and applied ecology from the University of Delaware, where he met Sean, da uh, Sean Dash. He lives on a small farm in Northern Maine, where they also grow hops for the craft brewing industry in Maine. So please let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Johnston. Hey everyone, how you doing? I'll, uh, I'll share my screen in a second once I get the PowerPoint up. I just want to thank you all for inviting me to Pete and Sean and the whole, the whole club. And uh, yeah, I met Sean, I was in my master's program and I, I'm pretty sure I TA'd uh, courses in avian biology and taxonomy and perhaps mammalogy and Sean was an entomology prodigy and I'm not exaggerating and, and I didn't really know much about insects. I liked wildlife but in this department of basically a few wildlife people and a lot of entomologists, I ended up going out with the bug guys a lot and uh, digging up logs and finding lots of interesting things. So it has really rounded out my entire career actually and changed the, the course of my career because I've incorporated insects much more into my understanding of community ecology. Can everyone hear me just fine? If you hear occasional noises in the background, it's my four-year-old who I have 
over here on the other side of my screen while my wife and other daughters are out. So um, she's watching her iPad and having fun. So we have until uh, 8.30, right? Yes, yes Jason. I will, I, I like to not use up the whole time so there's time for conversation and questions. So I'll do my best. I figure this talk would take about 40 minutes and I'm, I'm happy to entertain questions in the middle or after, feel free to interrupt, raise your hand if I don't hear or see you or whatever. So I'm gonna share my screen here. All right, how's that? Good? It's good. Yes. All right, so uh, I'm actually gonna mainly talk about two studies and they both of them focus on citizen science and actually, unlike most of the research I do, someone else collected most of the data and, and those people were mainly citizen scientists with some involvement by me. Um, so it's a little bit diverse. Uh, hopefully uh, it's not too much in one fell swoop, but we're gonna talk about a little bit about trees and flowering plants but mainly about bird arrival in spring migration. And you'll get to learn a little bit about Northern Maine at the same time. And I should say, I've spent a little time in Virginia, but mainly out to the West, not near you. My brother lives in Stanton and we spent a lot of time hiking in the, the national forests and I spent time in West Virginia. I loved being out there. So the first project that I'm gonna talk about, I'm just gonna mention, and maybe this is a, teaser for a talk I might give in a year or two because the data analysis aren't done. It's been a big five-year project. Um, and what I'm interested in is understanding how um, ranges of birds have shift, shifted in relation to time, which may be related to climate change. And so we're actually, we've looked at arthropod, basically insect and spider, food used in, in about uh, 25 species of birds in different feeding guilds, but importantly, some that are expanding into Northern Maine, like the Cardinal, and some that are just at the Southern edge of their range, the boreal birds that we have in Northern Maine. So we have this interesting mix. And so uh, we've collected all these fecal samples and we've extracted DNA and we haven't done all the analysis yet, but from one bird, we've, uh, you can get anywhere from 13 to 42 species of insect or spider identified two species based on their DNA. I won't go into all the details, but it's a, it's a pretty interesting capacity that's been developed over the last 10 or 15 years. This is an old uh, sketch from the Wilson uh, Bulletin, I believe from the 60s. And what it shows is the Northern Cardinal range. And I know you guys think Cardinals as common as can be, but I remember the first one I ever saw, I was 20 and it was in coastal Maine. I still remember where I saw it because I was like, wow, a cardinal. In the 1960s, that sighting would have been um, happening in Connecticut. So they've been expanding relatively rapidly if you think about a few decades. And now they're uncommon in Northern Maine. In fact, they're mainly in residential suburban areas. So that's, that's really about it on that project. It's a big project, but I don't have much to share. And what I'm mainly gonna talk about next are two projects that relate to timing of spring migration and other phenological changes in other organisms. So, and this, again, this is sort of a citizen science story as well. And I know you're all birders and birders really contribute to a lot of data. Okay, I can't really see much on the screen at all. I mainly see my own screen and Sean's picture. So if, if anyone has any questions, just find a way to uh, distract me. I remember sitting, reading my email when I get up like one morning at 5.30 and I get an email from this, uh, this professor and I rec kind of recognized the name and he said, we found a data set from your area from the 40s and 50s and we're wondering if you would like to help us collect contemporary data to compare changes over time from that data set to the contemporary one. And then I thought more about the name 
and I realized I had one of his textbooks on my shelf. And uh, of course, I wrote him back immediately, said, wow, you know, that's pretty amazing. And then I also remembered, if, if you know anything about Richard Premack, he's done a lot of work. He actually took a lot of Thoreau's um, observations from the, you know, 1840s, 50s, and compared that to contemporary, uh, you know, Cambridge and around Walden Pond, et cetera. He's spent 15 years probably publishing data like that. And someone found a data set from Northern Maine that we could do that same thing with. So that was pretty cool for me. And the first part of this talk is about that data set. So within two weeks of that email, they had a flight book. They came up, they gave a talk, and we went out to this place, which was a, basically a deserted, uh, actually it was a foreclosed house in this place called Oxbow, which is a plantation, meaning there's like 75 people that live there. It's in the middle of the woods, essentially, um, on the edge of the biggest area in northern Maine. That's all woods with no people living there. So pretty interesting. Here's a picture of us. His grad student, Caitlin McDonough, uh, was the lead on the project. I was a collaborator, um, so I want to credit her here as well. For those of you who don't know where Presque Isle is, um, and Oxbow is pretty close to there, that's where I am. Uh, we're pretty far up here. It's pretty cold, lots of snow on the ground, and I'm hoping that within 10 days our first grackle will show up, just to give you a sense of the phenology compared to what uh, you see, and probably by about March 28th or 30th, we might get our first red-winged blackbird sighting. I keep track of these every year, all the common birds. You can see there's not many people up in our county, which is the biggest county east of the Mississippi. Probably the most sparsely populated. Here's a little cartoon of it on the left and, uh, and a Google shot of the site, which I don't know what it looked like 60 years ago, but it was probably pretty similar and he basically ran a hunting and fishing guide establishment in this place. And this was the area he took these observations. So essentially the data are uh, data from this, this guy named Quackenbush, the guide um, from 70 years ago, and then some contemporary observations from a local birder and friend of mine, and then some observations by a botanist and myself, basically trees, common flowering plants, and birds. We kept track of about 70 species. When does the first flower come out? When does the leaf, uh, uh, the bud break? And when's the first date that we detect a species of bird? I won't go into all the details and the methods and sometimes the picture's worth a thousand words. If you look at this, it shows the uh, trees, flowering plants, and birds. The axes are a little confusing because it's on the X, it's mean April temperature because we couldn't really use dates for reasons I won't exactly go into, but just in terms of number of years that we could collect data. So we compared the arrival or leaf out or flowering date um, in relation to the mean April temperature or other things like May temperature or a variety of variables. Pretty clear pattern that trees are leafing out earlier flowers are flowering earlier when April is warmer. The bird pattern is non-significant. Um, it actually looks like it's kind of rising, but that, that line is no different from flat. So there wasn't really much of a pattern in the, the bird data from the, the hunting guide. Don't know if you're used to looking at uh, p-values and coefficients, but what this is essentially showing, and I'm, Sorry, I have my zoom a little bit in the way of the screen, but um, the, the significance values, the p-values that are less than 0.05 is a significant pattern. And what you find for paper birch all the way down through ash is that they're basically four and a half to three days per degree Celsius earlier in their leaf out. Um, so showing that relationship to spring temperature. So I guess I might want to explain at this point that it's a bit of a transitive process, you know, correlation to spring temperature. Um, and then you kind of have to look at the changes in the spring temperature and I'll have that data later as well. In terms of some of the uh, flowering plants, 
again, most of the ones that we kept track of all the way down through Buttercup um, were significantly earlier in relation to warmer April temperature. And this is probably something I don't even need to tell many of you. You see those patterns in your own experience in your backyard, but this is some data from a guy that kept track of this every year for 15 plus years to kind of show this. I don't think he actually paid as much attention to the birds based on uh, you know, the, the raw data, um, but there are eight bird species that we had a pretty good data set for, and two out of eight show a correlation with spring temperature. Uh, one being a, the least flycatcher, which is a pretty late arrival here. Um, and then the other white crowned sparrow, which actually is a transient. They come through in May, but they're on their way to Labrador or Northern Quebec. They don't breed here. So that's kind of interesting. Um, and then there are four out of eight um, that arrived earlier in recent observations for which we had enough quack and bush data to compare to. So least flycatcher, white crowned sparrow, and then add in yellow rumped warbler, or myrtle warbler, and chestnut sided warbler. So back to the same graph, but to show a point, and you may all know about this idea of an ecological mismatch. Um, when birds show up and the plants that they're used to showing up with have already leafed out, the insects are, are way ahead. And so there's a mismatch between the peak of food availability uh, and when they arrive to their breeding habitat. And so later in this talk, I'll talk more about long distance versus short distance migrants and how that ecological mismatch can really impact potentially their uh, breeding success. But this shows that clear disconnectedness between uh, bird arrival, relatively flat, and then uh, the plants leafing out much earlier based on heating degree days, essentially. So we got this published in a, in a regional journal, which was pretty, pretty fun and exciting. And actually, I, I got an email from my undergrad advisor one night. He's like, did you know you were in the Washington Post? And I was like, no, no way, how? He found out about it, I hadn't seen it yet, but the Washington Post picked this up for their science story, and, and I'm not trying to uh, brag here, but just to show that people are really interested in stories like this, where citizen scientists have collected data, and then it becomes useful to actually inform science, which without those data, you know, you can't go back 70 years and collect data. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, now on to project number three, as it were. Um, how am I doing on time, Sean? You're fine, Jason. It's only a quarter of eight. Any, any questions before I uh, move on to the next one? All right, so the interesting thing, and I'm trying to weave a little bit of the story through this. We had uh, uh, Richard Premack and Caitlin come up from Boston, and of course they gave a seminar, and this being a really little town, that actually made the news, and they occasionally would follow our science seminar. And so uh, we ended up being on the local news that night. The next day I get a phone call from a guy, and, uh, he says, I saw you on the news last night and I've been collecting data on bird arrival around my house uh, nearby for uh, since 1969. I have it all written down at 44 years worth. Would you like to see it? <laughs> and I was like, I, I was literally beside myself. And uh, so we started a correspondence of data. And now he didn't exactly just, uh, you know, send me an Excel file. Uh, but he had kept track of all of these birds. He sent me 32 species, but he kept track of way more than that, for which he didn't have data for every year. He had them all in one notebook and I ended up going down to his house, seeing this 44-year-old you know, notebook that he'd kept every year. This is a, a copy. He basically, well, it's not a copy. He took his notebook and would transcribe four or five species on lined paper 
put it in the mail and send it to me. And then either I or my work study would enter these data. We entered all the data in terms of when, what date each bird arrives. So if you look at this, um, this one starts in 73, but he actually started in 69. So he must not have detected bobolink early enough to call it the first bird of the season. So he basically had, you know, the, the first one is May, third week of May, 73. He used Roman numeral three, and then he switched to actual dates. And you notice at the bottom, he noted that habitat loss happened when a neighbor stopped mowing the hay field and it became overgrown. So this is a, we call this, you know, a sample size of one because it was, you know, basically his property and surroundings, many acres, but still one, but a really rich data set. So we transcribed all of these uh, into Excel and we made graphs and did some stats and I actually haven't finished, finished with these data and sent them off for publication, but I think it will be interesting. So I'm gonna go through maybe 10 or 12 bird species and some summaries. I won't show you all 32. Um, I just need to take, I just need to move my, uh, zoom around here it's blocking my view there we go okay so for each one of these and i'll show about 10 um i'm basically i have the, the the bird range from the cornell site a picture and uh on the y-axis the the date that he detected the first bird and then the year and then a regression line that shows the fit of the uh, data and the R squared value shows the fit of that line to the scatter plot of the data. And to let you know, an R squared in ecology of say 0.4 or 0.5 is a pretty strong predictive model that that one variable uh, contributes quite well to the dependent variable, the arrival date. And I think the patterns are pretty intuitive. I put up Grackle here first as a really stark example of uh, a bird that's arriving essentially 20 plus days earlier between 1969 and 2013. You see that pretty steep decline. When do grackles arrive around you? You, you probably have lots of them by now, right? Yeah, we get tons of them down here. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully some of those within, you know, six or eight, 10 days, we'll start seeing them up here, but Northern Maine is a little different place. We get really excited. We still have five feet of snow on the ground, so. They, they are already invading my bird feeders. Oh, come on, they're friendly little birds. Yeah, yeah, but they're hogs and they leave nothing for anybody else. <laughs> yeah. yeah, them and uh, blue jays, huh? No, nope, no blue jays. They're not bothering us. But I do have to say, we, we saw red-winged blackbirds about a month ago here. At our yeah, field. well, that's why I wanted to say, like, this is how, you know, this is the difference in, you know, northern Maine and, and Virginia. Hmm. So I, I actually, until, well, I guess until last year, every... We, every day we'd stop by this marsh and with my daughters on the way to school and you know we record the red-winged blackbird so we'll open open the windows and listen and you can you know hear the conquerie it's a pretty exciting moment so this year we're just going to drive out there because we're still doing uh, remote school so we'll just take a drive every morning off, um, topic, off topic but we also heard peepers about three weeks ago <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I keep track of those too. And usually it's May 1st or May 2nd or May 3rd. So yeah, the red-winged blackbird is uh, similarly negative and significant, although a lot more variation and not quite as uh, steep decline. And these poor males show up. I mean, there's still mainly ice and hardly any water flowing in the cattail swamp near us. So they're they're pretty hardy birds that show up. Their polygynous mating system really drives strong selection for showing up really early. Probably earlier than they want to and they probably don't have much food to eat and have to live on fat stores. Tree swallows, um, 
Again, another pretty significant decline. Good R squared of almost 0.5. I tell people locally, like, yeah, around April 16th, we'll get the tree swallows, um, you know, around now. And that, that tends to hold within plus or minus two days. Uh, you can see that, oh, and I guess I should have explained that my scale, I have it on there, but day 120 days after January 1st is roughly May 1st. Um, so in Northern Maine, they wouldn't arrive till after May 1st. And then by 2013, more like April 15th, 18th. So I, I won't keep explaining, you know, you can kind of see the same pattern here and I'll, I'll go through a little more quickly. Um, and these aren't all the same pattern. Rose-breasted grosbeak is a significant decline, although, uh, you know, not as much in terms of number of days. Although, and then we're getting to slightly different migrants. Hummingbird, which of course are, they don't, physiologically, they can't carry a lot of fat. So we're, whenever they arrive somewhere, they, you know, they might have a half a day of buffer and they need, they need uh, nectaries or feeders, I guess. But, and I have this picture of myself. I know you can't see me holding a hummingbird, but I'm pointing at it. We had this bird fest and like five minutes before this, that girl had asked me, she said, have you ever caught a hummingbird? I'm like, no, I haven't because every time they hit one of my nets, they just go through because the mesh is too big and the birds are too small. And my research, uh, I'll say assistant, but he was about my age and, you know, extremely competent. And he came around the corner with a big smile. He kind of heard me saying that. And he held up the bag and said, guess what's in the bag? <laughs> so that was the first hummingbird I'd ever caught, which was kind of funny. And the kids really got a, a charge out of seeing the bright coloration and whatnot. So that was kind of fun. Um, again, negative decline, not quite as big in magnitude, but 10 or 12 days over three plus decades. Don't tell me you guys have hummingbirds already. Yeah, there's a few around. They, uh, okay. Some of them over winter. Oh, okay, wow. Yeah, and that's, you know, like we're, we have robins over winter, wintering here now. Um, and when I was a kid, you know, never. I remember the first one I saw in the winter was in college. So a lot of those things are changing and it, you know, of course, it's happening latitudinally. Magnolia warbler, um, I'm sure you guys see them a lot in the spring, maybe not so much after that, but they're thick as can be in our, our well-cut spruce fir forests. Um, I've caught a lot of them in a variety of studies. Here's one that I caught that's banded. I, I've always loved magnolias. They're really beautiful. Um, another pretty steep decline of you know, roughly three weeks over uh, four decades. Kingbird, now we don't see that pattern. Um, of course, kingbird is a, a flycatcher, kind of a late arriving bird, generally in terms of all of the, the migrants, and uh, they don't seem to show any change. Bobolink as well, that's about as flat a line as you can get in a regression. Um, and if you know about the bobolink, which probably many of you do, they're really cool and that they, you know, they live on the highlands in South America and then migrate all the way up here. Um, I usually look for them and we have hay fields, you know, usually May 7th, May 8th, I, I hear that telltale song of the male. But they haven't changed at all. Uh, Viri, pretty similar. And Viri is also one that they have a pretty, uh, they're very long distance. In fact, um, actually another UDEL um, master's student, I remember reading a paper a bunch of years ago, he did some work where he helped elucidate the patterns where they actually spend late fall, early winter way south in Brazil, and then they head up more in the Amazon basin uh, later in the winter, and then they stage through to Northern South America before coming up across the, the Gulf, you know, across the Caribbean, pretty late. You know, they're they're a later migrant than say hermit thrush uh, for us, but no change over time. So here's a summary, and uh, basically by migratory strategy and 
have they changed with the year? And is that a positive or a negative? And the bold numbers, um, the numbers like 0.26 basically show the number of days change per year. And bold means that it's significant. Uh, Non-bold means that it's not a significant pattern. So you can look through there and see that probably what 40 percent not quite half um, are significant and i'm sure you know all of those species and can think how they migrate or where they come from or you know barn swallows are daytime migrants um you know they're, they're actually showing up later supposedly based on these data oven birds showing up a little earlier rose-breasted grosbeaks etc so the long distance migrants have about maybe 40 or 50%, at least of this set that I've summarized here, that have had a change at all. Here's the short distance migrants. And you see some stronger patterns here of, you know, essentially a half a day a year, which that ends up being a pretty big number, like 20 days over the course of 40 years for a lot of these, robin, woodcock, brown-headed cowbird, um, Sorry, I keep having to move my zoom because it's blocking my view. Which sparrow? Oh, that's chipping sparrow. Uh, so magnolia warbler. You notice that kestrel is actually on the positive side, and I won't venture to try to explain that. Um, most of these are negative, and then there are some non-significant trends as well. So most of these, you know, I've, I've shown you in graphs, but I summarized the table here of ones that I didn't include. So to compare the two early, or sorry, uh, long distance versus short, you can see that the, uh, the ones that are showing up earlier, um, for short distance, it's almost half of them. Whereas for long distance, it's only 23%. Ones that are showing up later, 10% for short, 23% for long, and ones that have no change. Um, I guess I, my apologies, I didn't have the percent summarized there, but uh, roughly 40% for short and uh, 50, 53 or so percent for long. So definitely some, some clear trends there, even though not all birds are responding um, in the same way. But the real issue here is the comparison between long distance and short distance. And if you know about how they migrate, the long distance migrants really have to know when to leave. And the only way they can know is based on photo period or day length because they don't have, they're, they're not even close to where they're heading to. So they've adapted to leave, say, Brazil or Colombia or wherever at a certain time. And, um, Whereas the short distance migrants can use weather cues, other factors, you know, current conditions in the Gulf, because they're not gonna cross through a storm. They like to have tailwinds, so they can use those factors and are probably more responsive. And these data suggest that, you know, support for that hypothesis, that the short distance migrants can react better um, to short term changes in environmental conditions that favor leaving earlier and getting to say Northern Maine earlier when there's still just a little snow on the ground. So I wanna talk just a little more and then uh, I'll be ready to answer some questions. Um, I wanna think about all the mechanisms to explain these patterns. So of course, you always gotta think about observer error or bias. So we had a, a hunting guide that he basically went out every morning and walked a mile or two and went to the uh, the post office and just kind of made the rounds. Uh, but he was one person doing that. And likewise, my data set from 69 to 2013 was one person on one habitat that may have been changing over time that he wasn't necessarily controlling. Like the bobolinks kind of disappeared because the hayfield disappeared. So there is certainly a potential for some bias there. Um, and, you know, habitat changes over time. And of course, weather conditions are um, expected to influence short distance migrants in particular. They're not gonna fly into bad weather. Um, maybe not so much long distance migrants, although certainly bad weather would stop them 
in a place if they were migrating. And then climate change generally over the 40 plus years. So I'm trying to objectively think of all the factors um, without just you know directly implicating um, climate change and find the real mechanism here. The fifth bullet, um, these long distance migrants really are well adapted to relying on photo period very strongly for when they leave. It controls their whole physiology. In fact, probably right now there's a Viri in you know, South America who's uh, starting to put on weight, starting to change its reproductive system, regrow its gonads because they actually completely, uh, almost completely lose their gonadal tissue outside of the time that they need it. So they're going through all these physiological changes because days are getting um, a little longer. And of course, they're actually, some of them may be south of the equator. So they have to figure that in as well on that physiology. The final thing, and I have a little more data on this, there's a lot of talk about some of these major atmospheric circulation patterns affecting uh, migratory patterns. So I have a couple of slides about that here. Oh, first, I, I want to show some temperature data. I hope you all know uh, Celsius because I have this in Celsius. But so this is uh, April temperature locally at our airport, which is PQI. That's Prescott. Um, you can see, you know, there's slight, a slight increase here of about maybe a degree and a half Celsius um, and 10 degrees Celsius. What is that? Maybe 40. 46, 7, 48 uh, Fahrenheit, pretty cold here in April, but you can see a slight increase. May as well is showing that slight increase, and this all relates back to the, the prior study uh, where we had uh, the Quackenbush data and related arrival time or leaf out to these patterns of April and May temperature. Even a degree or two Celsius can really change the phenology of plants and flowers, but one thing we're finding is the birds may be responding a little less to it, especially the long distance migrants. So probably everyone has heard of El Nino and this maybe the Southern Oscillation, which is the opposite of that, La Nina. Um, and so these are mainly affecting in the Pacific, but can also affect the Southern US with more precipitation. Um, and so thus may affect migratory patterns. So we wanted to look at that and there's these indices from NOAA. There's another one called the North Atlantic Oscillation um, and strong positive phases of this tend to be associated with warmer temperatures in the eastern United States which would suggest earlier uh, migration would be possible. And I know we've all heard a lot about some aspects of what's called the Arctic Oscillation because you know we have these deep dives of the jet stream and cause all these disruptive patterns like, you know, I think the last time I talked about this, I said, remember a couple of years ago? Well, now this year I can talk about, you know, how awful it was all the way down into Texas just several weeks ago. So that's related to the Arctic Oscillation, really sort of losing its uh, tight circle and the jet stream really running really deep down into the uh, southern U.S. So I'm sure you're all familiar with that because that, those storms were pretty bad a few weeks ago. So I wanted to look at these and they basically have these indices where it's positive or negative um, and you can relate that to bird arrival times. So we actually looked at that with all 32 species. I had a, a really sharp high school student one summer along with my undergrads and I, I had her uh, compile all those data and then look at regressions. So I'm not showing you the full data set, but essentially I only found any patterns at all for six of 32 species. Um, and really the only one that showed anything more than one or two patterns was the, the NAO, the North Atlantic Oscillation for um, Harrier, Veery, Robin, and Kestrel, which of course are all very different birds because uh, two of them are daytime migrants, the Harrier and the Kestrel. Robin is a short distance migrant that's pushing as hard as it can to get north. And Viri is a long distance migrant that's coming from about as far away as 
most migratory birds come to northern Maine. So I don't see tons of patterns there, except that clearly um, it affects them because it's in the order of a week earlier when the North Atlantic Oscillation is bringing warmer weather to the East Coast. So that's essentially summarized here. The top left shows that positive mode when the jet stream is going kind of across the Atlantic and a little bit southerly and leaving warm air where you are and even up into southern New England. So really not a lot of uh, really strong patterns there given that there's 32 species and only four showed any sort of significant pattern. So to conclude here, oops. Um, pretty, in the first study, there was a very clear response of both flowering and leaf out um, and a few short distance migrants uh, relative to local weather um, in terms of 40 to 70, 70 year shifts in climate. Um, there was definitely a lack of response of some short distance migratory birds, but upwards of 50% showed earlier arrival, which is pretty consistent with testable hypotheses, but less for the long distance migrants. Um, that local e ecological mismatch is probably more pronounced for long distance migrants. Again, we didn't measure that part of it. We didn't measure breeding success of those birds here, but I know from lots of prior work on wood thrush and others that that's a big problem. Um, and the wood thrush I studied in Delaware even then we were uh, you know, talking about that as a, as a problem for their conservation. And finally, little evidence of much effect of these uh, atmospheric patterns, although there was um, some influence of the North Atlantic oscillation. All right, so there's a final picture. I, I'm holding a cardinal. None of my research assistants would ever take a cardinal out of the net. Um, if you know about an angular commissioner, you know how big cardinals bills are, but I would show them like, just do this and then take a little stick, put it in their mouth and they'll bite the stick and they won't bite your finger. But I ended up taking out all the cardinals in the end. We actually only caught 11 and we spent many, many, many days looking for cardinals and only found one nest. They're that rare in Northern Maine, but we're, we're searching for rare birds and trying to understand how they're shifting north. So I'm going to stop there and uh, I'll stop sharing my screen so I can see you all again. There we go. Happy to take any questions or comments or unrelated things or anything. Hey Jason, I've got a comment. Um, the uh, You're talking about the weather patterns. Um, my uh, my brother and sister live in upstate New York, and a few years ago, they finally started getting Carolina Reds. And then about, oh, uh, maybe four or five years ago, uh, we had a really big um, cold winter up there, and it knocked them back. And they've only recently uh, made their way back up. So uh, they're slowly migrating back up, and I'm assuming that you probably not had any in Maine. No, they're, they're getting pretty, very common in Southern Maine actually. And on one of these, uh, there's this particular place where there were, I don't know, there'd been titmouse sightings, which we don't really have here, cardinals. And then one day we were trying to catch a cardinal. I'm like, wait, I haven't heard that sound for a long time. I know that sound, I know that sound, <laughs> you know, and you know how the Carolina Wren is. You're like, oh my God, it's a Carolina Wren. And I, you know, I had, we're always using an iPod because that's how we catch them. And I was like, Carly, go, go change my iPod to Carolina Wren. And uh, it, you know, it came right in and sat on the, on the telephone pole and just sang at us. So we didn't actually catch it, but um, yeah, that was, that was the first Carolina Wren I've heard or seen in Northern Maine. And there's been a couple sightings, I think before that and, and since that, but yeah, Carolina wren, uh, titmouse, all rare, uh, yellow-bellied woodpecker, you know, establishing in southern Maine, but I think there's been maybe three sightings in northern Maine.
So it really is a shift of those mid-Atlantic common species to occasionally showing up up here and probably in upstate New York as well. We're pretty similar. We're on that same, you know, same biome. This is Kathy. Uh, Jason, I have a question. Um, um, you mentioned that uh, the long distance migrants uh, will use day length to determine when uh, they need to start north. But many of our long distance migrants are right around the equator where uh, there is no difference in day length. Uh, it's basically the same uh, throughout the year. So I'm, I'm a little confused. Can you provide some additional information on that? Sure, and I'm, I'm not an expert on that. And I've, I've wondered about it myself, like, I, as I sort of alluded to with Aviri, you know, that they're, they're basically going from somewhere well south to somewhere around the equator on either side. And so how are they figuring that out? Um, I don't know, and I'm not familiar with tons of research on that. I do know, in fact, I just the other day refreshed my memory reading an animal behavior text. Um, there's an ant bird species that spends, you know, it's a, it's a tropical resident right in the equator and where day length only varies by an hour throughout the whole year. And someone had done a study where a 17 minute change in day length made them be photosensitive again. So, so birds basically, they, after the breeding season, they're photo refractive. In other words, they won't go into breeding condition again till they've gone through a several month window of refractoriness where no matter what you do, their reproductive parts just won't do anything. But they go into uh, longer nights and then there's a certain threshold of longer days that can reenact that physiology. And so I suspect that probably those ones that spend their time on the equator have a much more sensitive system and it might be that 16 or 18 minutes can initiate that physiological response. Whereas if you're a, a, you know, a red start or a magnolia warbler, you know, in the Caribbean, it might, you know, might be a, a longer threshold of time. That's my suspicion based on some knowledge, but not, I haven't researched it exactly. But yeah, it's really interesting because I mean, these, it, I've always been amazed by the fact that, you know, the sun goes through their skin, thin little skull, you know, they have these receptors and then, you know, the, the pineal gland is releasing melatonin and they've got this whole clock and, and then it kicks in all of their reproductive and metabolic physiology to gain weight and regrow their gonads. It's, it's really pretty amazing. Uh, a question about uh, 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 maybe uh, uh, bird physiology uh, uh, with this uh, uh, response to uh, duration of daylight, uh, or are they responding to uh, 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 the total solar radiation that they might get during a day? Because that could vary a lot year to year. Uh, for long distance migrants in tropical areas because of uh, these climate oscillations like ENSO affecting uh, uh, cloudiness. So uh, is, are, are the birds, uh, uh, is the physiology they're responding to uh, uh, the, the, the total uh, day length or uh, uh, the total amount of uh, sunlight that they get. Uh, right, I don't know if you can see the smoke coming out of my ears, but I'm, I'm trying to think really hard about that. Uh, I guess, uh, I think it's more about duration. And I remember we actually, in my PhD program, we kept birds in captivity. And there was one study where we needed to keep, we needed to have them not be exposed to light at all. But um, I think it's more about the duration of that light. So even very, very low level light is gonna, you know, activate the retina and there's gonna be light sensed and it's more about the duration of even minor uh, light activation. So I think even if you had 10 cloudy days in a row where the duration was exceeding whatever threshold, it would activate that. That's my, 
that's my hunch. Um, but again, probably something I should follow up on as well. But it, duration is definitely the thing that most researchers have found when they've studied this experimentally. Well, thank you. But uh, the, this, this very interesting information that you've been giving us, can you tell us a little bit about your area of, uh, of Maine? Are there, is there a long-term trend in uh, the, uh, uh, the vegetation cover or uh, uh, land use? Or too many of us uh, uh, Southerners going there or, or uh, uh, other types of contamination? Uh, well, I can tell you, you know, when I, I grew up here as well, and then I went to Southern Maine for college and then Delaware, and I get to know Western Virginia. And I mean, I was like, it's starkly different in many ways. And, but even Northern Maine is quite different from Southern Maine, we're rural. I mean, like, so I'm surrounded by hundreds of acres of farmland. I've got a neighbor a thousand feet one way and three quarters of a mile the other, and we sit on 75 acres at the same time. Uh, you know, the agricultural land and the forest land is heavily managed. You know, there's plenty of wild land as well. We certainly don't have the invasive species in Delaware or surely coastal Virginia. Uh, we have some. Um, certainly the impacts of agriculture and forestry. In fact, I just wrote my state senator who introduced a bill very bravely. He's a forester, um, but he's a uh, Democrat in a very uh, conservative area that relies on agriculture and forestry. He introduced a bill to ban glyphosate spraying in the forests, which was, uh, I told him that was pretty courageous. So there's a lot of issues like that. And I would say neonicotinoid pesticides are probably one of my biggest concerns because uh, the insect populations, I, I would say, are greatly impacted by them. Is that kind of answering your question? Yes, thank you. Uh, it's it's interesting stuff about Maine and what you've been describing. But we have, I mean, we live in a place with lots of lakes and beautiful, you know, water, woods. I mean, it's like I drive 30 miles into the woods to go to our family cabin, like into the woods on a dirt road. So it's 13 million acres where there's not a house, not a cell phone, not a power line, just the woods and you know, satellite phones or whatnot. So it's it's a pretty wild place. Well, thank you. Hey, Jason, I have another question. Um, you talked about the general uh, shifting of uh, birds coming back early in the leaf outs and the flowering. Um, were you able to identify um, species specific to um, certain trees or flowers or arthropods that you know they fed on? That last, those last two words, they that they fed on. Yeah. In other words, you know, um, some of the species that are coming in early, um, were they? Uh, did they have a specific feeding on certain? Um, trees, you know, uh, or certain arthropods that were, you know, um, coming, uh, that were available? Yeah, I think that's something I need to do more digging on. I've just sort of done the, the, the course basic analysis on the arrival patterns, but like, um, and I think really the, the long versus short distance migrant is the, is the big pattern. However, um, you know, the, the flycatchers, even one example of the kingbird not showing any pattern, that may reflect the fact that the large flying insects that they specialize on maybe aren't available. So it'd be interesting to look at, say, the flycatchers, you know, the impidinax flycatchers and kingbird versus, say, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think what might be the earliest, you know, compare them to the ground foragers and the leaf cleaners. And in fact, this other study that I talked about with the Cardinal, where I have a lot of data, that's, that's what I'm trying to understand is what is each guild of bird eating? And then we also have insect availability over time where we can understand what are the patterns of insect emergence. And prior studies I've done, for example, have shown that 
spiders are really super available early in Maine. The, the two places I've studied food availability in Maine, and they decline very sharply, at least in terms of pitfall traps, um, by July. So it may be that the ground foragers may be able to do better on those ground dwelling, not, not that all spiders are ground dwelling, but um, as well, beetles show up. I don't, I don't want to group all the beetles because that's a big group, but there are some beetle patterns that show much earlier spring emergence. And then of course, caterpillars are one of the key uh, foods of, of birds. And, and they also come out early because that's when the leaves are producing the lower amount of secondary plant toxic compounds. They like to eat the leaves when they're you know, relatively young and uh, nutritious and not as toxic. So I guess, you know, I have some ideas, but I don't have uh, tons of uh, data to tie all that together yet. I'd welcome my entomologist colleague, well, entomologist and all around naturalist, Sean. What do you think about that? No, yeah, I agree. Know? What? I agree with you, Jason. Do you see some of those patterns in the Mid-Atlantic too? Um, so there's some studies that are showing that things are being a little bit more active earlier. Um, some of that because it's what you get funding for. So butterflies, because people are interested in butterflies, there seems to be some of these overwintering butterflies that are coming out a good bit earlier. And, um, but, and bees, so I'm on a bee listserv and they're looking for some bees in now. Um, from the USDA in Maryland, there's a big bee guy, and they're looking to try to collect these early bees that the little listserv thing was talking about that he would never have collected in early March in the region five, 10 years ago, but now just with a little bit of effort, they're picking up those bees hmm. now, which they are active for a little bit, but they kind of fall off and you don't see them that commonly and they're not around all year. So you're having this, as you were talking about, some of these things are coming up that would be food, but then they're gone by the time the birds get here because everything's flowered and, and moved past their, their foraging time frame. And I know that it's a similar study that William and Mary did on the Eastern shore, but it's for uh, fall migrants. And they looked at what uh, variety of food is available and they based uh, they categorized the food as far as the nutritional content, and then they looked at which birds were feeding on which food sources to try to sustain themselves through migration. So it was a, it's a pretty interesting study to correlate what the habitat that the birds were frequenting based on the um, food availability and the nutritional content of that food, whether it be insects or whether it be berries. Yeah, and I mean, your region, you know, from you up through Cape May is <clears throat> so critical for those long distance migrants and their stopover, you know, because many of them just skip right around Florida and, and come up and stop there and then, and then one more flight to say Northern Maine. Yeah, because I was going to ask Jason as a just kind of a thing for you to think about that in part piggybacks off of what Tom asked you, is that do you think these neotropical migrants are getting this potential double punch with climate change and then landscape alteration along that route that might be playing a role in their decline or at least abilities to efficiently and not energetically be stressed as they migrate up? Well, yeah, certainly, and I mean, you know, from the time I left Delaware, Doug Tallamy became, he really entered that, that area because it was so important. And I, I really, you know, coming from Maine, I was amazed in Delaware at the, the extent of invasive species, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, Russian olive or whatever people call it, or, you know, all the, uh, all the prickly bushes and multiflora rose. <laughs> Um, and I, I really do think that, yeah, I mean, those native insects don't eat those leaves and uh, 
So it's really disruptive to the whole system. So yeah, I think the migratory stopover, the breeding habitat, and of course the neotropical habitat in many places, whether it's coffee plantations, development, or you name it. So it's yeah, a double or even a triple punch. Yeah, I, so because you know I'm from this region, and then when I went to El Paso, there's not that many non-natives that are around, right? So you do okay. have things like tumbleweed, which is Russian thistle, but everything because of the Chihuahuan Desert, it's all it's hard to invade. And mm -hmm. then moving back here, like I just forgot how many invasive species that were. Like I have uh, some wood in the backyard that's been there for a while. And um, I was playing with my son and he kicked the ball and I went over and flipped up some bark. And there was a, it's called a Chinese needle ant, but they don't fly. So they don't have mating flights like other ants. So they have to crawl around. And so like, how did that individual get there? I'm in a relatively community, but it's all kind of landscaped and there's not that much area for them to crawl from. Where do they come from? And it's just things that have limited dispersal capabilities like that ant not flying, it has to kind of crawl or get moved in in soils, made it into my yard and now has a nice established colony, but it also pushed out my, my winter ants that were living in those logs. And then another group of ants, these little porthole ants that were living, because they, the Chinese needle ants, for people in this area, they just take over. So our local mm -hmm. parks, even in the last few years, where I would get 10, 15, maybe 25 species, it's down to two species and it's mostly just these there's needle ants that are just dominating those soil food webs that are, and I'm doing some stuff where I'm collecting some pitfall trap to see if I can compare pre-invasion to post-invasion for diversity overall, which of course, as you were talking about, could potentially impact bird diversity and, you know, cascade through the ecosystem that way. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Are there other questions for Jason or Dr. Johnson as it might be? Jason, Jason's fine. Or any other comments? Well, let me ask you guys, has anyone ever been to Maine? All right. Sure. Where have you guys been? I've been in the Bangor, Acadia area, along the coast. <clears throat> yeah, I love going there. Kittery Point. Oh, nice. Just right in the south. Yep. Coast. Do you know the bushes? Or <laughs> uh, 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 no, but I'm told that my uh, my uh, grandfather-in-law. Uh, worked on the uh, 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 from Bates College. Worked on uh, uh, a blight there. Uh, okay. Of, of some kind of berries. Hmm. Yeah, I know. Our our state was always very proud to have the the bushes, and they were really good good residents. Yeah, very nice talk, Jason. Really enjoyed it. Well, good. You know, I, I've done this a lot, and I, I give lectures, well, you know, a couple, three a week I record or whatever, but I still haven't gotten used to talking into my screen and not even being able to see anyone. But, uh, you know, I, I feel like occasionally, like, wait, is my mic off? And <laughs> But uh, it's otherwise I never would have been able to meet you all and talk to you. So there's trade-offs. So thank you for the invitation, and I'm glad I connected with Sean. It's been a bunch of years, and I really appreciate it. Yep, thank you, Jason. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. All right, yes, thanks thank a lot, you. Jason. That was really awesome. Thanks. Okay. Good night. Good night, everyone. All right, good night, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. I hope everyone's well, and I hope to see you in the field shortly. Bye. Be safe. Thanks, Sean. Right here.